Hey there, welcome to this episode of The Cutting Room Floor. This is a segment where we get to dig a little bit deeper into an idea from a recent message here at Sunny Slope, or we can explore a topic of interest or relevance that maybe just hasn't come up recently in uh, a message. And that's actually what I want to do today. I you know, yesterday was the solar eclipse here in, well, it was not so much in Oregon, but it was across a lot of the United States. Uh, we saw it just a very little bit here in Salem, although cloud cover kind of made it hard for most of us to see it. But what I noticed um, coming out of this was there were some of these predictions about the end of the world. There were some people that were writing and kind of online chatter talking about, is does the solar eclipse predict the end of the world is there any any idea here that maybe the the fact that there's this big eclipse is that maybe a hint that the world is ending and so i got into thinking a little bit more about what the end of the world <clears throat> will be like what does the bible actually teach and one of the common ideas out there is or, or the common i think it's a misunderstanding is what we call the rapture um typically the rapture is an idea, it's something that people, when they're talking about the rapture, they're talking about something that's um, that's seen in movies, it's seen, it was made popular about 25 years or so ago, maybe 30 years ago, with a series of books and then movies uh, called the Left Behind series. And these books and these movies made, kind of brought these these this teaching and this idea into the mainstream culture. And in in a nutshell, what the idea of the rapture, as it was portrayed in that book and uh, in those books and in the, the movie series, the idea of the rapture was that the world would be going on just like any other day. And then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people would just suddenly disappear. They would just be gone. So they'd be flying on an airplane or they'd be driving in their cars. And those who were Christians would suddenly, they would not be in the world anymore. There'd be like a little pile of clothing wherever they were. And maybe their cars would, would you know, keep careening down the highway or whatever. But Christians would all just disappear. And that was called the rapture. And the idea behind that was that Christians were suddenly snatched up to heaven. And that's still how a lot of people, I think, when they think about the rapture, that's, I think, how a lot of people kind of imagine it's going to go down. And what I want to do in, in just these next few minutes, I want to kind of dig into that and, and try to show you where that is actually not really consistent with um, with, with biblical, uh, with, with what the Bible actually teaches. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you first off, where does, uh, where, where, where do we come up with this whole idea of, uh, of what the rapture is? So I'm going to pull up my screen. And I'm gonna um, I'm gonna show you from First Thessalonians. We're actually gonna be in chapter four, and I'm gonna give you I'm gonna show you one word here, and then we're gonna kind of explore. Well, actually, there'll be two words that we kind of explore. But let's look at this one word here. This is in First Thessalonians chapter four, and it's here that we read uh, where Paul is talking about the return of Jesus. And this is where he gives some details. This is one of just a couple places in the Bible where it gives some details about what will happen. And this is what we read here. The trumpet call, the, the sound of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first here. And then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I didn't really actually um, draw my lines very nicely, so I'm actually going to kind of erase all that for... But I now that I've highlighted, but I'm going to actually just what I can do now is I can draw your attention really to two key words. The first is uh, is this. It's it's this caught up together. That's the first word that we're going to look at, and then I'm going to try to show you more from the second word here of meeting the Lord. Those are two key words, and that's actually where we get the whole idea of the rapture. So. If you go into the Greek, the Greek text, um, actually, I'll show you the Greek text here. Whoops, I have to erase those words again. Um, the Greek text for the word um, caught up 
is this word here. It's the word in, in Greek, you'd pronounce it harpazo right there. Whoops. Harpazo. Um, most of you, maybe you can read Greek, but most of you probably not. You don't really need to know. You just need to know that this is the word here. A-R-P-A-Z-O, harpazo. That's kind of how you transliterate it. And as you can see, this little wheel here actually shows us, it's, it's a tool that we can use that helps us see how is this word translated. And you'll see here, some places it's caught, take, plunder even, carried away. Um, oh, and uh, if we scroll down just a little bit, you actually see, um, see every time I do this and I lose my my markings all are off base but anyway here's all the different ways that it's translated that's really what's what's relevant and I think what stands out here if you look at all these words caught take plunder carried away snatch what stands out is is it's a pretty sudden motion it's a pretty it, it conveys the idea of a very sudden action in which um, a person or in some cases an object or an item is moved very quickly. And so it communicates this idea of something very sudden, very abrupt. Um, and it's this, it's, it's this word that actually is, is used to describe what the rapture is all about. Now, the idea of the word of the rapture, the word rapture, as it's understood theologically, is actually comparatively pretty new. The idea of the rapture being an event in which believers are caught up or snatched up in the air or taken up in the air and suddenly just disappearing without a sound and, and without a trace, that idea is actually a pretty new idea in terms of the long history of Christianity. That idea is traced to about the 1830s. And what happened in the 1830s? Well, there was, um, let's, um, I'm going to actually bring up a different screen here. So let's let me show you um, a different screen because the what happened in the 1830s was the um, oops, was a a theologian uh, and a, and a movement called premillennial dispensationalism and it had to do with a scholar by the name of uh, Schofield a pastor who was Schofield his name was Schofield. And uh, and a number of others who created this theological scheme, you might say, and by that I just mean a theological idea or a framework that divided history and all of these into these major uh, seven major um, uh, time periods. And in each period of time, they were all called dispensations. Each period of time, God dealt with His people on on a different basis. Now, I'm not going to get into too much about dispensationalism right here, but dispensationalism became very closely tied with a view of the end times that is known as premillennial dispensationalism or premillennialism. And that has to do with, with uh, the understanding of history um, while well, breaking down like this. You have here, and I'll use my little annotation tool again, over here, you have the death and resurrection of Jesus. And this begins this new period in history and it leads all the way through until the present time. So we're right somewhere in here. This is according to premillennial dispensationalism. And then there will be this moment here, the rapture. I'm just using the letter R there to stand in for the word for the rapture. And at the at the moment of the rapture, that's when believers will be snatched up to heaven. They will disappear into the clouds without a trace, a la the Left Behind movies. And that will be followed immediately by this seven-year period of time. Uh, but that will be a seven-year period of tribulation. So that's when everything in the world is really left to go to hell in a handbasket. And so during that seven-year period of time, um, there will be wars and fighting. And it will serve as one last period of time for which non-believers who were not raptured can still repent and still claim and look to Jesus Christ and be saved. After that seven-year period of tribulation, there will be this thousand-year period of time, and, and according to premillennial dispensationalism, it will be a literal thousand-year period of, uh, of, of peace. So we're going to call it like this. 
we'll use the peace sign. A thousand year period of peace and tranquil uh, tranquility in which Jesus uh, returns and is ruling here on earth. I should have put, um, I should have indicated that here. So Jesus, Jesus returns at this end period and he rules for a literal thousand year period of time. I'm going to have to erase that. Oops. Um, and after that thousand year period of time, then uh then take then then the final judgment takes place so this actually this just to be clear should be judgment so so this jesus is ruling in jerusalem during this long period of time a thousand years a millennial that's where we get the idea of premillennialism so because the rapture takes place and the return of jesus takes place pre or before the millennium and then there's the the judgment which then leads to eternity the new heavens and new earth uh so in this way of looking at things the rapture takes place all the way back here and this is when believers will be taken up to heaven followed by a seven-year period of time then a thousand-year reign of christ on earth the final judgment and then eternity um there are other there are other viewpoints on this i'm really not going to get into those right now just because i'm trying to keep our focus on what is the rapture and how does that all relate um, the problem there's there's a problem with this point of view and and that to 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 explain that I want to take us back to our uh, to our text. So let me um let me do that. Let me let's clear these drawings here. And then let me take us back to the text of of uh, First Thessalonians. Whoops. So I'm going to bring us back to our uh, to our text. And I'm actually going to, I'm going to just stick with me for a second. Um, I'm going to put up a bunch of Greek on the screen, which can be a little hard to follow, but I'm going to show you those two words again. Um, uh, they are, um, right here. And right here, so here's that word arpazo. It's been, it's been sort of conjugated so that it fits with the proper text and so on. So, but that's that's the word right here, and then, uh, and that's the word you know to be seized up or to be caught up. So it communicates that that when Jesus at the time of Jesus returns, it'll be a very sudden event. But in order to properly understand what that means, we have to go to this next word here, and this is the word apontasis. And this word, in in my judgment, is critical for understanding what really happens at the end time. So let me take you. So then, because then the question is, okay, well, what does that act? What does that word actually mean? And that's where I want to take you to, um, to like a Bible word study of that. So when we when we come to the word apontasis, we're back to it here. You'll see the word right here. It's a word, now it gives you the English translation here, meeting, and what, what you see here, uh, just so you understand what it is that you're looking at, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to show you what you're, what, you're, what you're looking at so you can make sense of this. The word apontasis, it appears, you can see down here, three times in the New Testament. And comparatively speaking, that's not a very, that, that's not too many occurrences. That's only a, you know, very, very small handful of times. And you'll notice that basically it's translated the same way every time. Three out of three times that occurs, it's translated as the word meet. And then you can, you can look down here and you can actually see where those, where that word is translated. Now, I want to show you something important so here this last one is the is the text we're looking at the first thessalonians text so we already know what that one means but then notice this at midnight there's a cry the here is the bridegroom come out to meet him and that's a parable of jesus where he's actually as the story goes the people in the town actually leave the town and they meet the bridegroom a, a little ways outside of the town and that then actually fits the same way here when you look at Acts 28, verse 15, and you see that the, when, when the brothers there, when they heard about us, that would be Paul and, and Luke, came from as far away as the, of the form of Appius and three taverns to meet us. So 
once again, what those two verses, what these two verses here have in common is that the meeting that takes place is not just people getting together, but it's a group of people going outside of town, leaving and meeting outside of the town or the village or the city, and then returning with the visitors back into the city. And interestingly, when you look further at this word, what you can actually do here, so that's the first thing when you do a word study, you look at where does this word occur and what does it mean? But then you can also pull up a dictionary, which is what I'm going to do here. I'm thinking you can still see this on the screen. Once again, you see the word uh, apontasis. Here's our word. And this is the dictionary definition then of that word. Whoops. This is the dictionary definition of that word. Now, you'll notice... Um, the word here, it says the word apontasis is used for the public welcome accorded to important visitors. Similarly, Christians will welcome Christ acclaiming him as Lord. Now, that's that's the dictionary definition, um, which is a way of saying that the word apontasis is actually, it's a technical word. It refers to a very specific action and event. It's it's actually a welcoming, it would be today like sending a welcoming delegation or a welcoming party outside of a city to greet guests, um, maybe at an airport, maybe at, you know, meeting them somewhere outside of town and then giving them a, a, an escort back into town. Now, why is that important? Well, that tells us what the rapture actually will be like. It will not be this um, sudden disappearing of everybody and we look around and all of a sudden all the Christians have vanished and the world is left to go to hell in a handbasket. In fact, what it will be, if if first if if this if Paul is using that technical term in the way that's consistent with its meaning, which we have no reason to think he isn't, what it will be, it will be a very sudden event and a very sudden moment in which believers are suddenly taken up. But, but what we'll be doing is not disappearing from this world. We'll be forming a welcoming committee of sorts that will meet Jesus in the air as he is coming down to earth. And then we will receive him at that moment for the final judgment and the, uh, and, and the, um, the new heavens and the new earth. So, so the idea of the uh, the idea of the of of the rapture being something secretive and hidden, where we all disappear into heaven for a long time, be it seven years or a thousand years or whatever other variation, simply I don't think is consistent with what the text actually means. I think we're actually looking at something different, and arguably, I think something something better. Um, so that's you know the end times look. How do you predict it? Well, the you know does a solar eclipse tell us? No, it really doesn't. But maybe this gives you a little bit of insight into what will happen when Jesus returns. It will be sudden. There'll be no real way to predict it or to expect it even. But it will take place suddenly, and we will form that, that, that group of people that welcomes our Savior in the air and escorts him down to earth where he will judge the living and the dead and begin the new heavens and the new earth. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time here on the cutting room floor.